Last week, we found a resto druid with over 7,000 games played in Solo Shuffle. Yes, you heard us right, 7,000. For months, they had hovered around 2k rating, but needed an extra push to hit elite in the last week of the season. So we gave them three separate VOD reviews, pointing out key mistakes that they were making in their gameplay. With these reviews alone, they gained 500 rating in the last week of the season. Quite the epic push. This, of course, was part of our user review system, where for a limited time, SkillCap members can submit their footage to be analyzed by Rank 1 Gladiators. These VOD reviews go hand in hand with our new micro commentaries being rolled out for Season 2, where you can learn key concepts in just a matter of minutes. To learn more about SkillCap and how you can gain over 400 rating risk free check out the links below until then we hope you enjoy this resto druid review hey guys this is big man this is going to be a vod review of a 2k rated resto druid in solo shuffle playing double warlock into red warrior and the most important thing we're going to learn in this matchup is some simple positioning rules that you can safely follow when you're playing with casters into melee because one of the most frustrating things specifically as a druid in a fast meta is getting attacked by double melee it can be a very difficult situation to deal with, especially right now with Red Paladins being as strong as they are and Warriors being as strong as they are. The fact that the Red Paladin has just disjointed cooldowns, their wings is always going to outpace your Iron Bark. You're going to have to do a lot of navigating uh, this mashup through other ways other than your healing. And that's going to entail someone on your team, whoever's the kill target, using positioning to your team's advantage because the way you're going to win this matchup is if your Warlocks can out-pressure the enemy team, the way they're going to be able to out-pressure the enemy team is reliably casting, and so we need to keep that in mind, that the biggest advantage we have in this matchup is our ability to just turret down a target, and we need to make sure that we're able to do enough damage to push the enemy melee back. So our goal is to keep our team in a position where they can deal as much damage as possible. Now, PvP talents here and talents aren't that important. What I will say is that it might have been better in this matchup to switch from Circle of Life and Death to Invigorate since there's only one purge effect on the enemy team and if your teammates are doing a good job keeping up damage then probably the priest doesn't have that much time to offensively dispel. So this is one adjustment you can make. Again, difficulty in this matchup is that the enemy team's cooldowns are always going to be disjointed from your Iron Bark. So you need to find like other ways to deal with these micro bursts and maybe Invigorate is one option. PV talents are pretty standard here. Always gonna wanna play with uh, Keeper of the Grove. Always gonna play with Focus Growth. And then this third option, Reactive Resin or Thorns would be fine here. It's really no, no big deal. So because you're playing against double melee as a caster cleave, what you always wanna keep in mind is, again, your, your teammate's ability to free cast. And as a druid in this matchup, you don't have to play really aggressive at the at the start because you want to be utilizing as much space as you can and keeping a distance from your teammates. That way, whoever the melee decide to attack, they're going to have to run a long distance, a further distance in order to travel between targets. One thing I will say as well, and we'll see it in just a moment, is when you're pre-hotting against a class that has a dispel effect, instead of stacking your life bloom up to three, it will be more efficient to put two rejuves on the target after the initial life bloom. And we're going to see that the reason why in just a moment. So look at what's happening to your warlock right now. They just got purged on their three stack life bloom. So that was instantly gone. So three globals worth of healing was removed by one global from the priest. If you had had a bit more, if you had double rejuve on them, and not had com and not committed to that triple stack life bloom in this moment, um, it would have avoided that situation. No big deal. He can just simply come out in this moment and start life blooming, or we can again uh, pre hot like we normally would. I believe you're going to overgrowth here, which is maybe a bit too aggressive in this moment, but it kind of makes sense in some ways because if this if this warrior if this this rep out and walk towards you and press blind press hodge press fear and you had no hots on your warlock that'd be a really bad situation but because they have all their cooldowns up and because you're kind of far away far enough away that that interaction isn't possible this overgrowth might have been a bit too overzealous it's not that big a deal it doesn't really change the outcome of the game too much but that's just something to consider that you should really be selective when you use overgrowth use it coming out of stuns or you know, in, in openers where there's going to be a lot of instant CC on you, that's going to be one of the, the cases where you're going to press overgrowth. But if you do a good job just kind of ranging the melee, you don't really need to overgrowth here. 
there's uh, there's no need, but it's no big deal. So here we have the first set of cooldowns being popped by the enemy team, and it is going to be the Avatar and Colossus Smash from the Warrior, and I believe Wings will be coming soon. So you pop Tree Form, and this is this is good. I really like these early Tree Forms. And here we see that the team is pretty set on killing your Warlock, but I believe they're going to make a swap on you right here. And you decide to Vortex in this particular moment, and we're going to come back to this Vortex later. You can already see though that the, your team has managed to force a trinket from the warrior with the coil and the pain suppression so your team is just teeing off right now so you can already see how much damage and how much pressure your team is able to apply if they're able to just stand there and hit the target and so i want you to keep that in mind because we're going to revisit this concept in just a moment so here you get stunned and you're stunned in travel form and this is a minor mistake and it's a bit of a habit I, you know, I do this myself where I, I tend to think that my mobility is enough to allow me to survive. You know, if I just need to get away from people and that's, that's my job, I, you know, I could go and travel for him and fast, no one can catch me, but that's not the reality of, uh, of Dragonflight, right? Melee have insane mobility and it's very difficult to rely on your travel form to put you in any safe position. So since you already have incarnation up here, and the paladin has not committed their hodge yet i would just sit in tree form instead of trying to run away and travel form because that way if you get stunned you're gonna have some extra armor your hots are gonna be empowered but if you try to just get away with travel form well this is what might happen you get stunned and now you're not happy so when you're when you're in tree form like this just sit in tree form just don't don't even bother swapping out you might need to swap out for bear form but uh just try to sit as long as you can here you decide to trinket the it's done and it's probably because you saw wings here being used by the red paladin so this this is a trinket that is both a mistake and not a mistake at the same time and so that's kind of the difficulty once again of playing druid is you kind of have to make these really gambly decisions sometimes so you were stunned at around 80 percent you saw wings up and this might be a situation where you just instantly trinket but remember your tranquility will always save you so it would have been possible to simply sit this hodge and with if you had bark skin pressed and then when the hodge was up you potentially could have just lived this initial wave of damage without needing to tranquility it's sometimes a good idea as much as it seems difficult to do so to just wait and see how much damage you're taking before deciding to make a major decision like this so we're all pretty programmed at this point to think like oh crap like i'm stunned wait cooldowns are popped I'm gonna die unless I drink a tranquility. That's typically not reality, and you can kind of spend a little time seeing how much damage you're actually gonna take before deciding to invest a two minute cooldown and a three minute cooldown back to back to survive uh, this go. So kind of overzealous with this tranquility here. I understand why you did it, but in the future, what I would say is don't be as snappy with your cooldown. Just see what happens, okay? Try to set the hodge as best as you can with uh, bark skin alone that way if you press bark skin now it's going to line up with wings every single time so that's good but now you've kind of destroyed your cooldowns in a way that are a bit confusing you know we like to have one-to-one -one cooldown trades as a healer and if you're the kill target lining up your bark skin with with wings is going to be the play and even though wings is going to be arguably stronger than bark skin you still want to be looking to make these one-to-one -one trades instead you've made a trade of a two minute a three minute cooldown into a one minute cooldown well, a pair of one-minute cooldowns, rather. Anyway, very minor thing, but it's something to keep in mind. Just take a little bit of time to see what happens before deciding to invest any major cooldowns. There are some comps, though, you know, we have to admit that can 100 owe you, and so you have to be aware of that, and of course, trinket tranking in those moments is, is really important. So here, you can see that the enemy team has, at least for the moment, committed to you. And we're about to see the first positional mistake that's going to snowball into the loss. So if there's one thing that I want you to take away from this analysis, it's going to be the following interaction. So both of your Warlocks are in the center of the map. There's a Tyrant out in the center of the map, probably you know, doing a decent amount of damage. The Priest is in the center of the map. Okay, you have these two melee that are chasing you. Remember what we said at the beginning of the matchup. What you want is your casters to deal as much damage as possible. 
No, this is this is a throughput matchup. This is not a control heavy matchup. But like you're basically playing the Red Warrior equivalent of a caster cleave. You're playing with two casters who just want to turret as much damage as possible. The only way they're going to be able to do that is if the targets are in line of sight. So when you're getting attacked as a healer and you're playing with two casters, you really have to think about their positioning and play around it as best as you possibly can. Because if you go and try to line a sight behind this pillar here, you're not really doing much. Because remember what we said a minute ago, melee have unlimited mobility. You're never going to be able to get away from them, at least reliably. Instead, your best defense is your team's ability to deal as much damage as humanly possible. And the only way they're going to be able to do that is if you stay in their line of sight. So here we can see we gravitate towards the pillar. And now if we pause here, even though your team is forcing pain suppression from the priest, look at the health of the red paladin. They're at around 60%. The warriors at around 75%. They're pretty juicy targets. Paladin still has bubble, but the warrior doesn't have die by the sword. So your team has a lot of potential damage for both these melee, but they can't do any of it because you're currently out of line of sight. So this is a very, very common problem, and it's a very hard thing to kind of train out of your system. But if you play with casters enough, especially if you're playing on voice, they'll probably be screaming at you in this moment. Like I've been screamed at enough in this game by, you know, when I'm playing with casters, they say like, stop line of sighting me because they just want to deal damage. And if you're dragging the melee behind a pillar, line of sighting your team from who they want to attack, that's not good. So instead of kiting behind this pillar, it's good to utilize the open space in the center of the map, especially, we'll see in just a moment, if we can get the right angles, this little corner over here, okay? Because if you're standing in this area, especially kind of near the starting area, like somewhere um, in, in the edge of this map, the melee have to run all the way out here. They're going to be very exposed. In order for the priest to heal them, the priest is going to have to awkwardly position either at this pillar, and then if they if they stand here, then you can just drag the melee a bit uh, more towards the starting room, and suddenly they're going to be out on the side of the priest. You want to be in a you want to be kiting in a position that forces the enemy healer to make awkward decisions. That was where as where as to where they should be positioning. And at the same time, you want your team to be able to tee off on the warrior and the red paladin, because that's gonna be a big, your, your biggest defense ultimately, is your ability to counter pressure, which you can only do if your team is able to cast. And in just a moment, you're gonna see that your, your teammates are able to force bubble, I believe in just a second from the paladin. Maybe it comes a little bit later. And here you just bash the warrior and this isn't a bad bash at all but one thing i wanted to discuss and i mentioned this in the opener is the ursal vortex ursal's vortex you're playing with two casters and only one person on your team has a stun a reliable stun rather like a long duration stun that can actually be, be used to set up a kill i mean they both have shadow fury they both have coil so they have lockdown but they outside of those things you need to make sure that the enemy melee are pinned down and so this bash is fine since you're trying to survive, but it would have been better as the ultimate counter pressure if you would have bashed this warrior. Let's see where you bash them, because I believe they're bashed out of line of sight. Yeah, so they're bashed out of line of sight of your team. If you had to just delay this slightly and had Ursals to combine with this bash, if this bash was in the center of the map against this warrior with a vortex down and both your teammates teeing off, that would have been a very juicy play. So that's just something to keep in mind is if you if you're playing with a comp that has kind of limited lockdown and needs to be able to hit someone in the open, try to save your bash and vortex to allow your teammates to do that. So you're going to kite through the open and see just by casting on the paladin for a few seconds, your team force bubble bubble. So all that time that was spent behind the pillar, even though it was like 10 seconds, that could have forced bubble 10 seconds earlier that could have forced cooldowns from the priest or trinket from the priest or something from the priest had that interaction just happened in in the open and here you're taking quite a bit of damage again i believe you just overgrowth yourself which might have been a bit overzealous now um, i'm going to spoil this game a bit you're, you're going to lose and your warlock does decide to dark pact here uh this 
ultimately it was kind of bad on their part because I don't know if they're if the enemy team had fully committed to them in this particular moment. So your I think your teammate does technically make a mistake here, and I believe you're, you're going to have to NS them in just a moment. So this NS could have been held potentially too. It is kind of tempting to always just uh, NS when someone is low because it's it's hard to find that sw sweet spot where you have Soul of Forest and you can get value from Soul of Forest. But this this NS potentially could have been saved. You could have instead potentially just casted a regrowth here. I'm not going to talk too much about healing rotation because it seems like for the most part you're doing your healing stuff uh, correctly. Not much to talk about when it comes to that. So what's what's funny is when you're not the target, you're kind of in the right place. <laughs> you know, you're in a place where you you have access to the open the open field, but then suddenly when you you know when you are the target, it's it's going behind a pillar. And here your your teammate now is not going to be the one going behind a pillar. Here you have an opportunity to potentially CC the priest, and because you're playing against a red paladin, you know it's going to be difficult for your teammates to get fears out because of sank. Could have potentially CC the priest here. It's not that big a deal, but that potentially could have been. Uh, a game winning play it's really hard to say here tail warlock's just taking unhealable damage and i think in hindsight if you would have cloned the priest in this moment just a second ago when you had the opportunity i mean let's go back and see where it was so here you have an opportunity to clone the priest the ret is at 60 percent this would have been something that potentially could have changed the outcome of the game uh, specifically because you're going to get feared in just a second. Very minor thing, but that's something to keep in mind. You don't have really that many opportunities to clone, obviously. And when you do, you should just try to take them. And I mentioned before that I think it was a mistake of your Warlock for pressing their Dark Pact when they weren't really getting hit. And this is the reason why. If they instead saved their Dark Pact for this moment, it would have been way better. I mean, it would have been nerfed because it's in dampening, but no big deal. No. And your Warlock's going to die. So, I think the biggest takeaway here is there is a lot of wasted time behind this pillar. So these, these, I think it's only going to be for like 10 seconds. So let's see. You start at 57 seconds. You're, you move behind the pillar. And then at around, a, yeah, a minute and seven seconds is when you go back into the open. So that was only 10 seconds. But those 10 seconds could have been Cool, more cooldowns forced earlier from the enemy team, potentially a trinket forced from the enemy priest, but none of that was able to happen since you're out of line of sight during this whole exchange. So I want you to keep in mind when you're playing against double melee and you're playing with two casters specifically, that the best thing you can do is keep the enemy melee in line of sight of your casters because they're the ones who are gonna be, gonna be able to help you with peels, with counter pressure, and they can't do any of that if you're just line of sighting behind a pillar. It's, it's always really tempting to go to the pillar because you think it's a safe space, but it's a safe space in particular moments and in other moments like this one, it's actually a hindrance to where your team isn't able to get the counter pressure they need because the melee are being line of sighted. So if you're playing with double caster, always think about your caster's positioning because they're going to be the ones who can really determine the outcome of the game with their damage. Alright guys, that wraps it up for another VOD review. Once again, if you like this video or want to see more like this in the future, let us know what you liked and what we can do different. For a limited time, Skillcap members can submit their gameplay to be reviewed by Rank 1 Gladiators, who will watch through arena footage and give personalized advice for how to improve. These reviews are added to our hundreds of arena commentaries and go hand in hand with our PvP courses and epic class guides, which include brand new micro commentaries where you can quickly learn key concepts for Rest of Druid. In addition to hundreds of videos, you get to post questions anytime you want in our Ask a Pro Discord forum, where top players give you personal tips and answer challenging PvP questions. Last season, we helped thousands of PvPers hit their rating goals from Challenger all the way up to Rank 1. We're the only place that guarantees you will gain at least 400 rating while using our website. And if you don't, then you shouldn't pay. We're able to make this promise because our service actually works. Visit the links below to learn more. As always, though, we want to thank you all for watching. See you soon.